is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. Do you know who this is? Anyone? Honestly, I don't expect you to know who it is, so... Um, gentleman's name is Edward Steichen. And, and Eddie Steichen, as I'm sure all his friends called him, right? Eddie Steichen, uh, in 1895, he took the money, some money that his mom had given him, and he bought a camera. And he brought that camera home, and he decided, he was super excited to try it. And so that day, he ends up taking 50 pictures with his camera just inside the house. And eventually they were able to get um, the, the film processed, right? And so they had the pictures. And, and of the 50 pictures, 49 of them weren't good pictures. But one, his mom said, was a very, very good picture. And it was a picture of his younger sister sitting at the piano. Now, Eddie's dad thought that this was just a colossal waste. Um, but his mom said to him, one picture is definitely worth the price of 49 not-so-good pictures. And she encouraged Eddie to continue on um, using the camera if it's something that he really enjoyed doing. And he did. And, and many of us probably don't know this. I didn't know this, but uh, Eddie Steichen ended up becoming one of the great photographers throughout history. He impacted the way uh, photography was looked at, and it actually became an art form. It was just several years after he took that first picture where he is now with, with R Rodin, and Rodin's uh, posing like the thinker that he just sculpted, right? Uh, and, and, he, and Eddie's the one who gets to take these pictures. He's one of the the first people that started messing with gel colors um, so that you could create different colors that actually go on with the photographs, as you see in this picture of the Flatiron Building. Uh, he ended up becoming so famous that, 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 uh, that all kinds of different other famous people were asking him to start taking their picture. And, and as uh, Eddie Steichen was doing this, he started to begin to play with, with what light could do in shadows and, and reflections of light, and, and it, it just transformed transformed the way people looked at how photography uh, ended up going. And, and also in, when it came to taking pictures of people, he, he no longer just took them of, of a straight profile or something, but he would try to do something interesting with each and every one of them in order to capture uh, the idea around who this person was. Even in 1944, um, he ends up making this film because the military wanted to make sure that what happened in World War II was documented. And so they actually commissioned him. Uh, they, they gave him a rank, and he ended up going and, and, and documenting and putting into film um, what happened in, in World War II. But, but what I think is the most fascinating thing is this picture. This picture happened only 11 years after he first started. It's called Moonlight the Pond. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, I hadn't either. But I do know that in 2006, um, at the Christie Auction House, um, this came up for auction. you have any idea of how much this photo went for? $2.9 million. Most expensive photo ever. And Eddie Steichen would, would easily and quickly tell you that the reason why he stuck it through photography and through all the failures that he experienced was because his mom kept encouraging him to do so. Boy, if you love it, Eddie, keep doing it. Encouragement is such a huge and important part of each and every one of our lives, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's where we're heading today. As we continue in this message series, why do I need the church? And, and why does the church need me? 
The Apostle Paul, as, as he wrote this letter to the, to the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, he, he's, he's trying to walk them through understanding how important it is that we are together. He actually starts with, with unity, in, in that even though we are very, very different people, and there are Jews and Gentiles who hated each other, but now they're trying to live for Jesus together. He, he says we're called, even though we may disagree, even though we may not look or act like we're called to be together. And, and then from there, he goes on to just start talking about the the fact that we are called to pray for one another. And Paul, he says, this is why I kneel down. And he starts talking about how he wants us to know the thing that is almost impossible to know, the love and the power of Christ working in a person's life. It's beyond what we can imagine, yet somehow God does it and God helps us to understand it more and more. And then last week, we, we, we talked about how what Paul was telling then everyone is we each have this partial portion. We each have this portion that is given uh, to each and every follower of Jesus. As a matter of fact, I was talking to my sister uh, just the other day uh, about um, um, a bunch of different stuff. And she said that uh, she has been watching um, the, the, the messages, the services online. And her husband's been watching too, but sometimes he gets distracted and he's doing other stuff. And so, so she's watching and he's kind of doing something and he's nearby and every once in a while he'll say something just to remind her that she's that she that he's paying attention and and last week when I was talking about the portion that we all get and I start doing that that thing where I said and you have a portion and you have a portion uh, Mark uh, from the background says Justin's giving away Porsches to everybody in church you have a Porsche and you have a Porsche and it was like they were saying I was Oprah for everyone right but what was happening last week is, is each and every person who is in the body of Christ receives a partial portion, Mark, portion, a partial portion. And we are not wholly Christians without one another. And that's what, that's what Paul was trying to help them to understand. We need each other. We need each other for the support that we have. And then Paul, as he's finishing talking about that, invites us to encourage one another as well. Lord, help us now to, to in our heads, see where we are at or remember where we are at. We're all called to invest our portion in the body of Christ and hear how now words of encouragement matter. God, would you please open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, all of who we are, would you, would you open us to what your word is going to show us today? I, I want this to be completely and totally about you, Jesus what you would have for us, what you would show us. And God, may we invest in what your word says. May the words that I share and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you, God. For you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. And so at the end of last week, we were talking about how we are each a ligament um, that, are, that are designed to be formed together, and we are a part of holding together and supporting this body of Christ. And so now when we start jumping into the so, it's almost like a therefore. And so since, uh, because we are all ligaments, what, what Paul then moves on to say is, so I tell you this, and then it's like, no, 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 I insist on this, all right? This is not an optional thing for the body of believers. I insist on this in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. It, it literally is, is that you will no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. And so it's talking about the day-to-day life and how we just live everything out. He says, we don't walk the way the Gentiles walk. Now, Paul isn't attacking the Gentiles in the church, Right? What he is talking about is, is that there is this lifestyle of, of the non-followers of God 
or Jesus, right, uh, compared with the followers of God. And he's saying that those who weren't following God, those who aren't, we don't walk the way that those people walk. We don't walk where they walk. We don't do the things that they do. So we no longer must live as the Gentiles do in the futility, the uselessness of the way that they think. Why, why is their thinking futile? Why is it useless? Because Paul's point is, is they know they have heard about Jesus and they just ignore it. I mean, look at what it says. It says they are darkened in their understanding. Now, the word darkened means that they are blind, right? They are blind in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, the word ignorance here, it means willful blindedness. And so what it's saying is, is, is that they are blind because they are choosing to be blind. They willfully are, have heard the stuff of Jesus, and they're just ignoring it. They don't think it really matters to their lives. There's just something else that I'm going to do. And so I'm going to willfully be blind. And that's what they're saying, due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, the word hardening, it, it actually means a petrified or a solid heart. But the word also means stupidity. And I love that. It's almost like what Paul is saying is, is people are willfully blinding themselves from the good news of what Jesus said because they're stupid. I don't know if Paul would have actually said that or not. I don't know. But what he's saying is, is if we're going to allow our hearts to be blinded, the things that we have seen and heard, to just, to just be to turn a blind eye to it, it's not the smartest thing in life. You are choosing to petrify your heart, harden it against God. When that happens, it says having lost all sensitivity, which means this word means that you are choosing to be apathetic. Like, like you hear the God stuff and it's like, oh, well, big deal, whatever. I'm just going to move on with my life. And having lost all sensitivity to, to what God is saying and speaking to each and every one of us, what they've done is they've given themselves over to their own sensuality, indulged themselves in every kind of impurity. They're full of greed. And, and so what the image of what Paul is saying is, is, is because they are not listening to the things that, that they know that, or they have heard about Jesus and, and, the, and the power of what God can do in a person's life, instead of doing that, they're going to live the life where if it feels good, I'm going to do it. If it's something I want to do, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make that happen. I'm giving myself over to my own sensualities. I'm going to indulge in, in things that are impure. It's, it's fine, because really, that's what I want to do. So we hear about Jesus, and we ignore it. And Paul tells us that that's a life full of greed, because what you are choosing is really just all about you. What I'm choosing is just all about me. Paul's saying, don't live like the Gentiles. Don't allow your heart to be hardened. He says, that, that's not, however, the way of life that you've learned, is it? When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance to, with the truth of Jesus, when you heard about Jesus, you knew there was something different. You knew that this mattered when you heard this. You knew that this could somehow impact or change your life. It, 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 is, it is something that changes a person from the way they are to the way they can be. He, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. Life before Jesus says to put off your old self. Now, this is, starts talking about the fact that, that we have a role, we have a responsibility in this, in, in that, that there is this old self of us that we have to take off, that, that, that's being corrupted by sinful, deceitful desires in our lives, that, that we have to take this thing and we have to somehow remove it from our lives. Now, uh, imagine, imagine that you, it's, it's a very, very hot summer day, right? And you ended up, um, because you chose to if you're crazy or your parents made you, spend the entire day outside working in the garden. 
okay? And, and, and you're out there and you're sweating and you're getting all dirty and gross and filthy and disgusting, right? Because <laughs> that's what garden work is, in my opinion, dirty, gross, disgusting, and filthy. But either way, and, and, you're, and you're done and, and you're, just, you're, just beat, you're just filled with sweat and dirt and you go into the house, right? And you jump in the shower and you take a shower and you have this super refreshing shower and you get out of it and you're super clean, And then all of a sudden you start grabbing those same clothes that you wore out in the garden and started putting them back on. That's disgusting, right? Kids, when you take a shower, don't put on your old clothes. That's gross. Now, especially if you were outside and they got filthy and dirty, why in the world would you put those old clothes back on? The answer is, is we don't. And that's what Paul is trying to help these, these people in this church at Ephesus to understand. That there is this old way of life, and it's not good for us. It's not, certainly not what's best for us. And we have this role in, in taking this off and setting it aside and saying that this is not my life anymore. I'm not going to wear those clothes again. Paul's telling the followers, we have this role in putting away sinful habits. It's something that I need to invest in. Yes, God has forgiven me. God has, has, has taken away the penalty of that sin. But if I keep it in my life, there's just going to continue to be consequences of that sin. So Paul is saying, put those things away. You're a ligament. We all need to be people that are putting these things aside in the body of Christ. So we put off our old self, but why do we put off our old self? So that, it says, we can be made new in the attitudes of of our mind. Now it says to be made new, which, which means that this isn't our work. All right. Our work is, is we have to say no to the old clothes. But now we put ourselves in a position so that a new work can be done in us. So that we can be made new in the attitude of your minds. And the word minds here means meaning. It's not just the way that you think. It's the whole meaning of yours and my life. Our life now has a whole different meaning. Not just the stuff that I think about. Not just the way I imagine things. But the way that I think and I act, the things that I do, my entire meaning of life changes by putting ourselves in a position so that what God has for us is what I'm about to step into. Because if you look at verse 24, he says, and to put on the new self, which literally means to invest in some new clothing. Which, which means now we have some responsibility. God has made this new thing available to us, but now we need to step into the new life that God has given us. It's our choice. And it becomes our involvement to invest in this new clothing created to be like God in the true righteousness and holiness. The things that God wants us to be is the thing that we now make a decision to step into. The life is there. It is ready. It's available for us. Are we going to invest in the new clothing? Are we going to continually put on the new clothing? And then Paul, what he starts to do is he just starts to do some contrasting because this is the body of Christ. It, when, when we see our, the old self versus the new self, there's this very strong contrast of the way things were and the way things are to be. And so he just starts, he just starts sharing some of this. And he says, therefore, each of you must put off, you must put, and so again, it's a mandatory, you must put off falsehood, right? You know, lying, not being totally honest with stuff, right? Instead, what we do is we are the people that are stepping into a life where we're going to try to speak truthfully and honestly to our neighbor. Now, neighbor, what it's talking about again is the body of Christ. We're talking about the fellow believers with one another. 
And, and the image is, is, that, is that I am not going to show you an image of a fake Justin. But I'm just going to try and be real and honest with who I am with you. The struggles that I deal with. Yeah, sometimes the, how things are going well. But I don't want to lie. I don't want to show you something fake. We're called to speak truthfully to our neighbors, not about what they are doing, but about what I'm doing, what you're doing. Why do we do this? Because we are all members. We are all a partial portion of one body. And we need each other. And then he goes on to, to quote Psalm 4.4, 4, where he says, and in your anger, now again, we're talking about the negative side, right? The before side versus what, what we're hoping now is, is the, the new side, right? In your anger, do not sin. Which, for those of us who get angry, I put myself in that category, right? The good news is, is anger is okay. But we can sin while we're being angry. It says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, because that's when the issues begin to take place. It's when I start holding grudges. When I start looking at people differently because of one thing that happened yesterday or last year or 10 years ago. What Paul says as he's referencing Psalm 4, 4 is, is that's the former way of life, one that would hold grudges against other people. And you know what? The body of Christ, sometimes, myself included, we make mistakes when we're dealing with the relationships with one another. Sometimes I say stupid things. Sometimes I act in a way that hurts other people. Sorry. But if you're angry at me or I'm angry at you, may we be people, what Paul is saying is that we would just deal with the anger that we have and not hold grudges. So what Paul says is, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't allow the devil a place in your life, an opportunity is what the word means, an opportunity in your life to just hold you back even a little bit. Don't allow that to happen. Then again, contrast of negative to a positive. He says, anyone who's been stealing must steal no more. Just, just, just stop taking advantage of things that you can. But he says, but, those, he's talking about the, the stealing, right? But, he, but he's talking to all of us, says when he says, but must work. And, and the word work here means work to fatigue, okay? And so we're not just supposed to work for a little bit and then we're good to go, but we are supposed to work. We're supposed to invest in this new life that God has given us to fatigue until we are tired, we rest up and then we do it again and we do it again. We are to work to fatigue, doing something useful with their own hands. God has gifted me, gifted me with this portion that I have and I am supposed to invest and work in it, doing something useful with what God has given me that I, that they, that we may have something to share with those in need. The, the word is, is, is there's going to be occasions that happens in the body of Christ where someone's going to need your help. Work now so that you are able to help them, whatever that looks like. Continue to invest in your life now so that you are ready and available when the occasion brings itself so that I can help you and you can help me and we can help one another in the body of Christ. Paul just keeps telling to, to, to live this consistent new life instead of just the old. And, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that we get caught up in is, is a lot of times we think that just saying no to the old life is enough. It, you know, it, it's like if I, if I just stop doing all the bad stuff and, and, and maybe I start going to church more or something like that, then everything's going to be fine. But, but Paul's saying there's much more to just not doing the bad stuff. Certainly much more than just going to church, right? The, the, there's, there's this new thing that we have to invest ourselves in. 
It, it, it's kind of like, you know, we were talking about the old clothes. It's kind of like having an old coat, right? And, and, and it's a coat that is, it's been well worn. You've worn it for years, right? And it's, and it's, and it's, and it's tattered. It's torn. And you probably can't fit it around the stomach anymore if you're imagining the type of coat that it is, right? And, 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 and you know that what you're hearing is, is that this new coat that I have been given is the one that I should be wearing because this coat isn't really good for me anymore. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And so we take off that coat, and, and this coat that should be thrown away, what do we do with it often? We put it on a hanger, we put it in the closet, we close the closet door, and we put on the new coat. And then what happens in a day or two? We open up the closet door, don't we? I mean, I do it. We grab that old coat. Why do we keep grabbing the old coat? I think the answer is easy. I like the old coat. It feels comfortable on me. I've been wearing this coat for years. I know what it feels like. And people, when they see me in this coat, they know who I am. They know Justin's coming. And so I'll wear the old coat just because it's comfortable. I'm used to it. It's the way that I have been maybe for years. And then we start hearing things about this new coat once again. And what do I do with the new coat? Because I like the old coat. And what some of us will do is we'll take the new coat and we'll just start putting it on over the old coat. And depending on who we are around, we'll, we'll button it up or zip it up, hoping that the people around us won't see the old coat. But we know it's there. We know we're still wearing it. And here's, the, here's, here's what I think the reality is. is even though we are, I think, that I'm hiding the old coat from other people, the reality is as many people still see it. That I look ridiculous when I'm trying to pretend to be wearing a new coat over an old coat. And what Paul is saying is, let's be people that set the old coat aside. Let's throw it away. He's, he's encouraging each and every one of us to consistently make the choice to put ourselves in the position to learn what it means to live the new coat and then put it on and just try to live it out and be honest with one another and admit to say, I'm struggling, I'm wearing the old coat again this week. I don't want to, but I put it back on. Would you please pray for me? Would you pray that the power and the love of Christ could be made known even more in my life because I just put the coat on again? I know God doesn't want me to, but I did it. Sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Would you help me? That's what Paul is calling each of us to do with one another in the body of Christ than to be this group that just gathers around and supports one another. Why? Because we all put on old coats now and then. I mean, listen to what he says as he continues. He continues with the, with the, with the negative side versus the positive, the old self versus the new self. And he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, right? And so, so when you see or realize that I'm wearing my old coat, don't talk negatively about me, please, Right? If I see you or you, we see each other wearing the old coat, we don't talk negatively about one another. Be careful what comes out of our mouths, but only what is helpful with what? Building others up according to the needs, according to the occasion that we find ourselves in. How can I encourage you? How can I help you to, to be encouraged in the body of Christ to be living the new life that God has given us? Only what is helpful, the building one another up to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, now here, here's a key piece. 
We are called to be encouragers. We are called to say helpful things, things that are going to help you along your journey to living this life with this new coat. The reality is, is, is I'm called to share those words. I'm not called to make you listen to my encouragement. You're not called to make me listen to your encouragement. God calls us to listen. But when we speak, we don't have to make other people listen. We just have to speak the things that will benefit them in living for Jesus. It says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed from the day of redemption. Don't do things that are going to hurt what God is doing in your life and in the lives of other people because his spirit is working in you. And again, he talks about the negative and then the positive once again, where he says, so get rid of the bitterness, the rage, the anger, the brawling, the slander, every form of malice, anything in your life that's old, get rid of it. Make the choice to step into the new life that God has for you. Put on the new coat so that we can live a life where we are actively choosing to be kind and compassionate to one another. And again, Paul is talking about how we treat each other in the body of Christ. Why is it so important that that I should get invested in the church? Why do I need the church? Why does the church need me? Because we live this life of one another where I live a life of kindness and compassion that I am hoping will impact your life. And you will do the same with us. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. And Paul just continues to have us look around at the people with us, seeking to try and live the new coat. And say, let's encourage them. Let's help them. And if they hurt you, let's forgive them just as Christ forgave you and me. I did not deserve any of the forgiveness that God has given me. I'm so thankful he forgives me anyway. But he does not want to leave me here. He wants me to live this new life. And so I put myself in the position to say, what you want for me, God, what you want to teach me, show me, change my meaning. And I will begin to step into this life of the new coat. So this past week, uh, my youngest child, Eli, um, he finally got a couple of fish for an aquarium tank that he got for Christmas. Okay. And, and so he, you know, he was doing all this stuff to get it all ready. And the next thing I know, uh, he, you know, one day I come home and he's, and he has these two tiny catfish. They're catfish, right, Eli? Two tiny catfish uh, that are in the tank. And as I was talking with him about it, he said, actually, these cat, the, these catfish, you usually want at least five or six of these in a tank because they, they tend to, uh, to tend to work better in schools. And, and it just got me thinking a little bit about fish. And I don't know a whole lot about fish. I've never been much of a fisherman uh, or at all. Um, but but I, I just started thinking about it and and thinking about you know you know what are fish like and and one and one of the things that I started to, to realize as Eli was talking about the, that they need to be in this group of fish or this school of fish was I I don't know if that would be the most ideal place for a fish you know, as I was thinking about it doesn't it make sense to be the lone solitary fish as opposed to being uh, with with a group of fish. Now, now, now imagine this. So, so a large, predatory, hungry fish is coming around. Where do you think that they are going to go look for their food? Are they, are, are they going to go for the single solitary person? Or are they going to go where all of the fish are? just makes total sense to me that they would go to where all the fish are. Because I'm the same way. If you were to ask me, where do we want to go to eat this afternoon? I would choose the all-you-can-eat buffet. That's what I would choose. Why? Because there are so many options. And you want to know what I would do with my plate? I would fill it with meat. As much meat as I possibly can put on the plate. I would much rather do this than go to some hoity-toity restaurant where they put two little pieces of meat on this really, really large plate with a bunch of super yummy sauce that I can't even pronounce. 
I would rather eat a plate full of meat and be able to choose what I want. Why? Because I want meat. And, and, and it even goes farther than that. You know, I, I would rather be there all by myself. Cause, cause think about it. If you're at a buffet and there's six other guys who are trying to stay cold, cold, warm in winter like I am, right? Uh, who are at the buffet and, and they're trying to get the meat the same time you're trying to get the meat. No, I, I would, I would be gently just nudging them away so I could fill my plate first. It just makes total sense to me that I would want to be a single solitary fish in the sea. But here's what I learned is, is if, if I would do that, I'd be the one that was dead. Because fish seem to work better in schools. So, so I started doing just a, a little bit of research. I'm, I'm no expert on, on fish, right? But I start doing a little bit of research based on one of the things that Eli said to me was these catfish, they were, they were digging holes in the bottom of, of the sand. And I don't know if they do that because they're looking for food or whatever they're doing, right? But he shared that with me. And so I ended up looking at what something called a goat fish. And, and what the goat fish do, and they come in a variety of different colors. They're usually just red. I picked a prettier picture, right? But usually what the goat fish will do is, is they will travel in schools. And the reason why they do that is because they realize that, that the companionship that they have with one another helps them to survive. And, and goatfish will be traveling around in these large group of fish, and, and they'll, they'll typically be at the ground, and they'll be nuz, nu, you know, nudging in the ground. And what they're doing is, is they're looking for food. And if one of the fish finds some food in the sand, they will start doing it so aggressively that it attracts the attention of all the other fish around them. And the next thing you know, all the goatfish are cruising down to the bottom, and they start digging in because they know that they are all going to get some sort of meal together. It's almost like they need each other in order to find the food, and then they help each other so that everyone is fed. And, and then they are also so helpful when it comes to times of danger in their lives. They, they travel together in these schools. Now, if you imagine that a predatory fish is coming to them, that they, they figured out a way that if they are together with one another, and, and they somehow, in some amazing way, do their movements where it's almost like they're exactly moving in same time with one another, they do that in such a way that if they gather in a large group, it, 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 it can be threatening to the look of another fish. You see how large the shadow is, and some fish will swim away thinking that it's a much larger fish than them. Now, the fish that actually do go in and try and eat, what they will typically do is, is they, will, they will disperse at the last minute, and then they typically, what they said about goatfish is they gather behind the predator fish and swim the opposite direction. And I start to think, how fascinating is this? And why they need each other in order to survive. And of course, I start thinking of the body of Christ. And how we are called to be a school of fish that's able to help one another, especially when difficult things are going on in my life. How wonderful is it to know that there's this group that is around us that is helping us to maneuver and navigate through the difficult times in our lives so we can get behind it and move in the other direction. And I start to think about the one goat fish who is nuzzling in the ground trying to, to find food. And I start picturing some of us here in the church who are digging into God's word. And, and, and when we start to see and realize and understand something, so much so that we turn around and we start sharing it with other people. So that other people in the body of Christ are, are gaining nourishment from the things that I have learned digging into God's word. And you have learned and start teaching other people. This is the new life that God is calling the body to. Where we would live like a school of fish. Always with, always helping, always encouraging one another to fully live the way that God is calling us to in the new coat. May we be a people that will hear the encouragement from God's word and share it with others. Lord, help us to be a people that are willing to, even right now as I'm praying, just say in our minds, or even out loud, it's up to you, just say, God, 
I think I've been holding on or wearing the new coat. And today I choose to step out of that coat. Right now I choose to step out of it. And Lord, I put myself in a position where the meaning that you have for my life is the meaning that I will choose to step into. Thank you for your grace. Now, God, help me as I learn to live with the new coat, to grow and learn in you, and to encourage others as they are seeking to do the same. God, the things that I discover help me to share that with others. Also, God, help me to be honest when I grab the old coat so that I can truly be an honest person before my brothers and sisters in Christ living for you. And God, by your grace, may I receive the encouragement that I need from the people around me. And may I give the encouragement that the people around me need. And may we do that for one another. Jesus, we need you. And thank you for calling us to a life where we also need one another. We together are yours. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to the Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebentonchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.